Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel Dentistified. In today's video, I'll talk about the anatomic landmarks of mandible and biologic considerations of mandibular impressions in complete denture patients. So as we already know that for treating a completely edentulous patient, thorough knowledge and understanding of anatomic landmarks really necessary for making accurate impressions recording jaw relations and even adjustment of dentures. In fact, in almost every phase of dentistry, knowledge of anatomic landmarks is required, right? A successful complete denture construction is possible only if the clinician understands the difference between supporting structures, relief structures and limiting structures. So the supporting structures are those which are capable of bearing the stresses. Hence, these are capable of providing support to the denture. Whereas, relief structures are those structures which cannot bear the stress. Hence, they need to be relieved under the denture. And limiting structures are those structures which determine the extension of complete denture within the physiologic limits. Knowledge about limiting structures is essential for the proper placement of denture borders and you know proper placement of denture borders is going to enable the denture to achieve a good peripheral seal which further contributes to the retention of the denture. So this means that supporting structures they provide support to the denture, relief structures need to be relieved under the denture and limiting structures determine the extension of a complete denture and enables the denture to achieve retention. In this video, we will talk about the supporting structures. So if you are interested, you can continue watching. Supporting structures are those structures which are capable of bearing stresses under the denture. So now, since these are the load-bearing areas, they show minimal ridge resorption under constant load. Therefore, the denture base should be designed such that most of the load is concentrated on these supporting areas, right? Now, these supporting structures can either be primary stress-bearing structures or they can be secondary stress-bearing structures. Primary structures are those which are capable of bearing most of the loads. So now the question is how to identify a supporting structure? Which structures are capable of providing support to the denture? So usually a good cortical bone plate is capable of providing better support as compared to cancellous bone. And the structures which are covered by keratinized layer and which are firmly attached to the underlying periosteum, they are capable of providing good support to the denture. And the structures which are nearly perpendicular to the occlusal forces, they provide better support as compared to the structures which are sloping and which are steep. They are present at an angle to the occlusal forces and hence they cannot provide good support to the denture. Now let's talk about the supporting structures of the mandible. So residual alveolar ridge consists of three parts. First is slopes of the residual alveolar ridge. Then there is buccal shelf area. And thirdly, the crest of alveolar ridge. As we can see in this diagram, the green highlighted part, it represents the crest of the alveolar ridge. And these blue slanting lines, they represent the slopes of the residual alveolar ridge in this picture. And this yellow area, the yellow highlighted area, it represents the buccal shelf area in this picture. So the slopes of residual ridge and buccal shelf area, they act as supporting structures. That means they are capable of providing support to the denture. They are capable of bearing stresses under the denture, right? And the crest of residual ridge is mostly a relief area. That means it needs to be relieved under the denture. 
So now we'll discuss the mandibular supporting structures. First is slope of the residual ridge which is considered as a secondary stress bearing area and it is not a primary stress bearing area. Why? Because it has thin cortical bone and the walls of the slopes are steep and they are at an angle to the occlusal forces. As we discussed earlier that the structures which are at an angle to occlusal forces, they are not very good candidates for providing support to the denture as compared to the structures which are nearly perpendicular to the occlusal forces. Hence, the slopes of uh, residual ridge, they are considered as secondary stress bearing areas and not primary stress bearing areas. I hope this is clear. So the next supporting structure is buccal shelf area, which extends from the mandibular buccal frenum to retromolar pad area or we can say till the anterior edge of uh, masseter muscle. We'll be able to understand it with the help of the diagram. So in this picture, if this yellow highlighted portion represents the buccal shelf area, so here buccal shelf area is bounded anteriorly by uh, buccal frenum as we can see here in this picture and posteriorly by the retromolar pad area. And medially, that means towards the midline, it is bounded by crest of the ridge and laterally it is bounded by external oblique ridge. So the inferior part of uh, buccinator muscle, it gets attached in the buccal shelf area, but it does not interfere with the denture. That means it does not displace the denture. So now the question is that how can the buccal shelf area act as a supporting structure? If buccinator muscle is attached here, the muscle attachment does not restrict the coverage and extension of mandibular denture base. Why? How is it possible? Because the contraction and relaxation of this muscle would have resulted in the displacement of the denture. Then how is it possible that the attachment of buccinator muscle in the buccal shelf area does not interfere with the denture? So the reason for this is that the fibers of buccinator muscle, they run in horizontal direction or we can say anterior posteriorly in this region. That means the fibers of buccinator muscle, they run parallel to the denture borders in this area, in this buccal shelf area which further allows the denture to rest on this part of the muscle without damaging the muscle and without displacement of the denture. So another thing here is that as the resorption of uh, alveolar ridge continues, the width of this buccal shelf area, it increases. So now let's talk about the clinical significance of buccal shelf area which is considered as a primary stress bearing area because it offers excellent resistance to vertical occlusal forces. How? Because buccal shelf area is an area of compact bone which is obviously better suited to bear the occlusal load as compared to the cancellous bone, right? And the buccal shelf area is nearly horizontal. It is present nearly at right angles to the vertical occlusal forces. Hence, it is capable of bearing the stresses and is considered as primary stress bearing area. Therefore, it is advisable to properly extend the mandibular impression to cover the buccal shelf area, which is really critical for the success of the denture as it is the primary stress bearing area. So to conclude, I'll say that uh, proper distribution of stresses to the selected parts of the basal seat is possible only if we have sufficient knowledge about supporting structures, relief and limiting structures. We'll discuss the mandibular relief structures and limiting structures in further videos. So stay tuned for that. So yeah, do like this video if you find it helpful. And if you want me to make more such videos, do subscribe to this channel and press that notification bell, which is next to the subscribe button so that you will get notified whenever I post a new video. And don't forget to share it with your friends and colleagues. 
You can also drop your suggestions about the topics you want me to cover in the comment section below. I will see you very soon in my next video. Till then, take care.